Okay, well, let's, let's go ahead and get started. Um, I'm sure Judy and Don will fi figure that out in a minute. Um, good to see everyone again. This is our second official Zoom meeting. I guess third, though, Marty did the first one, didn't he? We, we used his Zoom to, uh, to do the first one. So this is our third official Zoom meeting. Um, I'm hoping that next month that enough of us will be vaccinated to actually have our meeting at Outback. Um, is everybody kind of up for that? I mean, uh, it's, it, Abbott has opened the restaurants and Chrissy, the manager, Ruth has been in contact with her all through this and they're ready to have us back. So uh, talking with uh, Dave before we talked about just having a uh, having an informal meeting where everyone spread out real nicely and um, we'll do our whatever uh, uh, spacing need that we have to have and we'll just have a an informal meeting kind of a hello good to yeah. see you again kind of meeting yeah like what's your name again <laughs> <laughs> you know that kind of meeting I think I know so you. i i think that'd be real real fun and uh oh okay so uh the other thing was the photo contest uh rich and linda and paul and i keep wanting to call her jessica jennifer are all in west texas there's uh photographing the Milky Way. So hopefully they're having some good weather out there where they can do that at night. So the your entries were due today at noon. And then next Sunday, um, we'll have the voting. Um, but you know, that's the way Rich set it up. We might can do that before. The, oh, that's when the voting is is over. That's right. Because I was thinking, God, that's an awful long way away. So the, the voting will be over next Wednesday, uh, next Sunday. Yes, next Sunday at, at noon. And then we'll hopefully have the winners. And with green being a topic, like Rich wrote out in his uh, uh, announcement, it should be a lot of people joining us. So that'd be great. So uh, does anyone have anything they would like to ask or talk about anything like this before Dave introduces our um, speaker for tonight. No? Okay, well, since there's not a lot going on in the diving world, if, if you're going anywhere, I, I guess really I'd like to find out from uh, uh, James and Ann, they're in Cozumel right now, so this is our first international meeting. So uh, did y'all have any trouble <laughs> getting down there? Uh, any no, um, we no. Uh, in fact, the plane was empty though, just about empty. We just came down yesterday. Wow! And uh, now to get back, the hotels will give you a PCR swab, and that's because of you know the U.S. is requiring it to come back in. Ah. Wow. Huh. Okay. So you've got to come show a negative test to get back in. But we're not thinking about that because that's two weeks away. <laughs> oh, yeah. two weeks. How wonderful. Oh, good. Golly. Yeah, we're going to stay for yeah April 2nd. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Okay. We do well, feel safe here, though. If you feel safe. The protocols and the uh, sterilizations, and it's, uh, it, it's, it's a pretty well-run operation. Wonderful. Great. That's good to know. Wonderful. Well, thank you for People letting us know even that. People wear masks on the boat. We we dive with Martin, and yeah. uh, you wear masks on the boat. You take one mask off, put the other one out, and roll over. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness! Wow. Well, that's cool. I right. I know several of the Caribbean islands are having a bad time with COVID. Uh, Bonaire was going to lock down hard again, and. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I believe uh, Caymans were going to lock down hard again. And then, uh, what, who else? I don't know. Oh, several, several of the, of several of the others. Mm -hmm. Aruba and several are, 
are going to maybe not do a hard lockdown, but they were getting more problems than they want. So they were going to lock up. So, uh, well, if we don't have anything else, oh, Jesse Canselmo. Good, Jesse. He's a PUPS hey, member. Hey, Jesse, good to see you. <laughs> all right. Yeah, so, uh, yep, that's all right. Yeah, he's, he's still connecting his audio. <laughs> um, then I tell you what, there you go. Hey, Dave. <laughs> Hi, Jesse. Hey, Barry, Hi, good to see you. Hi, Ruth. Good to see you, too. Here? Great to see you. Yep, it's good to be seen, right? Okay, uh, yeah. so now I'm going to turn the meeting over to Dave. He'll introduce our speaker, and it's all yours, Dave. All right, well, it's good uh, to see everybody. Can you hear me all right? I can. Okay, good. Yeah, it's good to see everybody, and uh, we're glad tonight to have uh, a great speaker. I think he's a great speaker. Uh, Barry said today, he said, well, how long have you and Dino known each other? And I said, well, uh, over the phone and so forth, but we've never really met. So we've been uh, planning on doing some dry suit diving. We just, one thing, another, either I'm flying or he's operating or this or that or something else. We haven't really got it done. We have a, a good mutual friend who actually runs his, uh, his dive store in Arlington. But uh, one day, Doc and I will uh, have the pleasure of diving together. But uh, Sabatino Bianco, uh, uh, better known, a.k.a. Dino, was born in Naples, Italy. He started uh, snorkeling and diving at a very young age. He's been an instructor for 16 years, and really his heart is in technical diving and, and a closed circuit rebreather. He is a, 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 a technical instructor. He owns a dive store in Arlington called Dino's Diving and teaches classes, everything from open water up to technical instructor, closed circuit rebreather. They offer uh, Nitrox and Trimex. Uh, Phil's and uh, he has done some very, very exciting diving in some exciting places. And he's going to talk a little bit about this tonight in a talk called Exploration Diving. So on behalf of all of Dukes, Dino, we welcome you and uh, are ready with, with a great interest to see uh, what you've got to show us. Well, thank you, Dave. And thank you, everybody, for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk about something that is quite unknown in the diving community, which is really exciting, is uh, exploration diving. You know, that's really what I enjoy doing. You know, we have a large group of uh, deep divers, maybe 10 of us that do through contract, quite a few uh, very interesting dives. We have some hopefully coming up, I doubt it. Next month, we should have uh, gone, actually last year to that HMS Urge, if you guys follow CNN and pretty much all the, all the channels, last year this some bridge submarine was found and there's still 115 sailors on board from World War II. And it's one of the latest great, great wreck. And we had an ROV going down and now we were supposed to be the dive last year with the daughter of the commander, she's 97 years old, on the boat with the Prince Charles. We had the whole thing laid out and then COVID hit. And the team is from, uh, everywhere, South, South Africa, US, Disney, all over Europe, so we couldn't do it. So hopefully we can do it this year, but uh, things don't look really promising for me to go in the next couple of weeks to Europe. But if, if I can share my screen, we can start. Let me see if I can have uh, this going on and hopefully it goes. <coughs> yeah. Okay, can you guys see the screen? Yep. Sure. Okay, uh, let's start with uh, the first thing I'm going to show is a, we call it a teaser, a one minute clip about exploration diving. This is a collaboration with uh, some friends that do a, uh, like documentary for Discovery National Geographic. This is a teaser of a show that really we were working before COVID and then never really was pitched to the promoters because of COVID. Hopefully we still have a 
thought when things get better to, to do a, actually a TV show, but that's the teaser for you guys. Give me a second, see if I can. I'm Dr. Sabatino Bianco, brain surgeon and technical diving are my passions. I thrive in an atmosphere of high risk and high reward. The goals of death watches. But we push our limits for discovery. I travel around the world and go on expeditions with the most talented technical divers I know. Explore their culture and what mysteries lie beneath their words. So I get down to about 90 feet, I hear the tick, tick, tick. Go down to the door, to the final frontier. Okay, did you guys see the video or the audio? I was issue with that. Uh, yes, it came through. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. So, the, the, you know, you, we all love in Cozumel, we all love Cozumel. So on the left side is a typical uh, recreational dives. You know, we have a single tank and we have our regulator, maybe a skin, fins mask, uh, sometimes snorkel and uh, BCD. And we are having the best time of our life. Now on the, on the right side is a deep expedition dive. We have a rebreather, about 90 pounds, full loaded. Then we have a, sometimes five tanks on us. And then we have three lights, three computers, three knives, three SMB, and on and on. We're looking about 200 to 250 pounds of gear. And the dive on the right, typically a depth in excess of 400 feet for every 15 minutes, we're looking about five and a half to six hour decompression before we can come in the boat. So even though the diving is a shared name, that's quite a bit of different uh, beast in terms of the skills and the risks and everything else, the preparations. But, um, in, you know, kind of general lines, what is exploration diving? Obviously we dive deeper than every certifications that you can get. You know, typically the deepest certification is uh, 100 meters or 330 feet. Now INDT does have an exploration certification but really nobody does. We routinely dive below 400 feet. So that's the first thing we go below any limits, which you know, tells you the risks. We always dive in team, even though that's kind of a little concept new for you guys. Recreational, we have the body team. Everybody has a body. In tech diving, regular tech diving, sometimes we dive solo, which is not really smart, if you will, but it's a commonly done practice. When we do tech uh, exploration diving, you gotta have a team for multiple reasons. Right. Most importantly, the gas share. We simply cannot have enough gas if an emergency happens to be able to bail yourself out. So we have three people and we have enough gas for two people. So hopefully all three don't get the same issue at the same time. Obviously we always have a safety uh, diver team. Typically they are open water instructors. They are diving up to the classic 120, 130 feet to supply whatever situation, whatever emergency can arise at that depth. Anything below that depth, we gotta be able to deal on our own. We always have a primary boat and a, at least one or two rescue boat. And really what we do, we dive wrecks or caves, which have never been done before. So it's kind of really dangerous because there's no way to talk to somebody that can tell you what to do and not to do and what kind of uh, entanglement obstruction you can face as you dive this wreck. So that's kind of the highlight. So on the top is a typical morning at five exploration team. We have everybody on CCR, what we discussed for multiple reasons. Obviously the most important on tanks, you should don't have enough gas, even with the big tanks, 130, you will be unable to do these dives. And then on the bottom, on the, on the left, you see the largest team from, uh, the Shalandi exploration, we're talking a second in details. Uh, that's a, was Malta 19 with the lady in green. She's the Ministry of Archaeology, Malta. And that team is composed of only eight deep divers. Most of the others are archaeologists. They are 
uh, safety divers and there are other staff that help us moving tanks. On the right is a expedition we did in the Brindisi looking for B-24 liberators. And uh, that yellow element is a uh, underwater uh, autonomous machine that you put coordinates, it goes down and scan the bottom of the ocean for five hours, comes up, we look at look, the, the archeologists primarily, but also we look at the data for anything that can look like a wreck. That machine is about four and a half million dollars there. It was sponsored by the Explorer Club. So that's other couple of exploration. This was a, a one on the left, the L72. We have in details slides about that one. You see the team there, quite diverse people. And then we had a large uh, underwater archeology span seminar in Poland where we were awarded quite a few uh, award because we find the L72, we'll talk in a second, it was a major, major loss for the Polish uh, troops in World War II. And once again, if we can go in June, we are going to look in the Baltic for the, the really the last mystery of World War II is the, a, sum, a Polish submarine called the Eagle, never found, nobody knows what happened to it, no data, allies never claim, the German never claim that hit it. So we have a sponsor from the government and full access to the Polish Navy to be able to hopefully find the submarine in June, if we can do it. Uh, this is a Britannic expedition in 2018. Uh, once again, Britannic, you guys all know, that's the sister ship to Titanic, built in uh, uh, 1916, stronger than Titanic after the major catastrophic event and was commissioned by the uh, British Army actually the Navy to be a, a uh, hospital ship. And in uh, 1916 was sunk by a, a mine of the island of Key and Greece. And there's a lot of uh, books about discussion. Was he carrying weapons or not illegally? Well, I, I, I've dove it and people have dove it. The cargo is completely empty. There's no bombs in there. This was one of those um, unfortunate situations where, uh, you know, the, the, the mine hit the bystander there, but that's a fantastic dive in uh, 420 feet of water, beautiful dive. Uh, that's Andrea Doria, 2016. Andrea Doria was my uh, mind kind of uh, hunch for many years, be able to dive a beautiful wreck, even though it's only in 250 feet of water. In my opinion, this one is most complex <laughs> and even the 400 plus feet. Conditions are awful. The window of operation is only two weeks. Currents are strong. It's 10% uh, mortality on this wreck. And in the past few years I've been on the wreck, I've seen three people that I deal with losing their life on this wreck, very, very complicated. Uh, this is the 2017 Andrea Doria expedition there. Uh, now some of the more uh, fun part of expedition diving, uh, we have some fantastic food. Typically we do this sponsored by government or agencies or universities so that provide us incredible meals. As you can see, the camaraderie is really high, uh, especially when the expedition is over because the risks are quite, quite high. So let's talk for a second about what I think is one of the most uh, incredible uh, expedition. As you guys know, the typical archeological excavation underwater is within a hundred feet. You gotta go down there, you gotta have a team, you gotta have a dredge, there's a lot of things and 100 feet is already deep. In 2007, there was a team of archeologists was doing a, a kind of a random scanning of the bottom of this little island uh, off Malta, about 10 miles off Malta, it's called Gozo. And they found an abnormality. They sent an RV, they found a forest. They thought it was a Roman cargo, which is quite common over there. <clears throat> Find out is actually a Phoenician carbon dated 2,800 years old. And uh, at that point, this was uh, one of the oldest wreck uh, ever found in great conditions. So every year we go and excavate it. We take sand with a dredge, two dredge, and in a very scientific way with grids and measuring stick, we do all the work. Um, you can see here what's going on is a photometry. So Every morning before we start and at the end of the day, we have two team of professional deep photographer. They do what, what's called photometry. So what they do, they're telling us how deep we have excavated 
And the first morning, Doc give the archaeologists a great picture without saying anything. So they tell us what they want for us to work on exactly. Each team has his own work. So this is the, the, the team number one going to do a kind of reconnaissance looking at the wreck after we finish excavating the day before. Uh, once again, this is now a photographer there, as you can see on the top of his rubrito, he has two tanks on the left side and two tanks behind his body. It's uh, quite incredible. The, those stones in the front, those are ballast. Uh, so I, think, I mean, I'm learning about the archaeology. At that time, there were no metals in the west side of the Mediterranean. So the anchors are made of stone. So there's a big stone with a hole in the middle of it. And that's what they had with a rope throwing off the boat to, you know, anchor in the, in the harbor. And once again, another picture showing the artifact. What we have been doing, we have been, uh, you know, going deeper. And uh, two years ago, we find a, what was felt to be incredible, a piece of metal. There was like a little metal knife, uh, we believe is a little knife. Well, I didn't know that before that, there was nothing metal on the west side of Cyprus. So the next day we have all the archeologists span from Paris, France, London, the British Museum, everybody was there overnight because this was an incredible discovery that actually there was metal used on the west side of Cyprus 20 years ago. And once again, this is uh, myself, I'm at the bottom there with the, you guys can see there's two of us and the safety deep diver is on the uh, right side of the screen. Now that's when we're working, it's messy. We have a grid, scientific grid, archeological grid, two people, two dredge. To be able to have enough pressure to dredge at 420 feet, we had to have a hydraulic engineer designing the right dredge, because that's quite a uh, 13 atmosphere that they have. So we're working at the problem, all the sand can go in the rebreeders, can go in the regulators. And if you have a malfunction at that depth, that's quite a serious issue there. And once again, at the end of the day, they go in and do another picture. And this is what we have at the end of the day. You see the wreck, the blue in the middle tell you the depth, how much we have excavated so that the archeologists overnight, they can make a plan, which grid they want for us to do and who is going to do what. So typically the worst thing when you gotta pick up a very unique artifact, some of those amphoras, they are not from the same batch. They come from different places in the world, like we do for tanks. You rent here and deliver over there. Those guys had done for us from all over the Mediterranean. And we find one of a uh, unique, was a commemorative plate that they used to give as a gift to the local, you know, king or whatever in, in the harbor. So that's apparent there's only three in the world. The other two discovered on land and they find, we find it, of course, I had the joy to be the one to clean it up and uh, took me three dives and bring it up uh, with a knife to my neck. If you break that thing, you, you're done because there's only three in the world. So I appreciate that kind of a uh, no pressure kind of deal. So that's the expedition. That's the team of photographer there. The guy with the red dress suit, he's a Finnish guy. He's uh, developed the software for photometry. And the guy on the right, He's one of the uh, light guy that goes with him. They go down and uh, that's pretty much their job in excess of 400 feet. That's the, the configuration we have. See the boat, interesting enough, the land is right there, 420 feet, 120 meters. And we have a, the white line is the, the line that we used to go to the descent. The black line, if you can see, those are the hydraulic hose. They go down to the, to the pump. Uh, that's the team right there that did this, one of the, this expedition. Now, this is a cool expedition, uh, B-24. A uh, fisherman went to the monastery of uh, the Fens in Malta, said there is something metal uh, there. They sent an ROV and find a B-24 liberator in perfect conditions. The university has a team of divers. That's only 250 feet, but in a very tough spot with the navigation overhead. So they find out it was an America B-24, <clears throat> was actually uh, lost at sea in 1943. They took off from uh, uh, Tunisia, going to bomb Italy. They got fired, they got shot. So they were coming back to Malta, which was the closest ally island and they couldn't make quite enough. So the five P-24 
people, five crew, the four, except the pilot made it, survived beautifully. The pilot was lost, never found. So the American, obviously, if there's any wreck, they take over the operation and they try to send a team of uh, Navy diver to recover the body. But as you guys know, the red tape is immense. That what was required was an incredible operation with the chambers and uh, physicians and nurses. So they probably contract us and the university to recover the body if it was in there. Uh, you can see the two engine on the uh, left wing the cockpit is on the very far left of the picture here. Once again, that's a wing shot. It looks like he sank yesterday, perfect condition. And now you can see the engine number two and the cockpit broken off. So in order to do the operation, we develop a plan to, that's aluminum obviously, to cut the aluminum skin and hinge with the lift bag. So we didn't destroy anything, dredge and then put it back. It was approved by the, uh, the uh, Navy and we did it. Uh, you can see here, uh, I don't know if you can see my mouth. So this is where the cockpit was. And we had to work under the cable and wires. We were able to dredge five feet of uh, mud, pretty much. We were blessed to find this young man, Romeo. He was uh, 23 years old from California. As soon as we found some of the remains, I got up in the, in the boat the full enrollment charts. There's no picture at the time, but there was his teeth. There was his name, everything. We matched, obviously, roughly. Then the body was taken by the ambassador to to Honolulu, they have a lab, and it was matched to this young man, which is great that he was uh, eventually found. And that's three of us doing the job right there. It was a two-week expedition. And that's a 3D photometry of the plane. Interesting enough, the University of Malta is opening a lot of those uh, wrecks. Unfortunately, they are deep. This is the shallowest one, 250. But uh, they have done the authority to three shops to bring divers under strict supervision and enjoy it. We had a lot of conversation and I feel strong that this is nobody ownership as long as people are guided and there's nobody taking any. I mean, we're looking about human remains, lab bombs. There's a lot yeah. of things that people unfortunately take. Uh, so it's highly regulated, but it's working very well to share this underwater uh, museum. Uh, now, L-72 was one of my first expedition, high-level expedition. This is a, a British des uh, destroyer, which, which was called the Oakley, HMS Oakley. In 1941, it was given to the Polish Navy and was changed the name to the L-72, or they called in Polish the Kubiak. This Kubiak was part of the Operation Harpoon in 2000 and, uh, sorry, 1942, when the convoy went hard, very hard attacked by the Italian and uh, German submarine, lost a bunch of wrecked boats. So he got two torpedoes was coming in the harbor, literally almost at the harbor. He got a final third torpedo went down. Went down, this guy was a submarine scout. So he had the depth bomb fully loaded and went down, there was uh, about 50 to 60 people that lost their lives. One of the guys they made actually, he came in the U.S. eventually to leave. His son, uh, Chris, he finished his career in the IT world, eventually retired and went to archaeology. And his goal was to find his wreck for his dad, which obviously has passed. So in 2014, the wreck was found. And we did three years of expedition. The last one was to retrieve the bell and be given to share between the Polish museums and the Maltese museums. And so this is, the wreck is in about 395 feet of water, but it's a very difficult, number one, there's nets and fishing lines everywhere, cables everywhere. And those depth mines, we had to go to, I mean, I did it when I was young, in Italy, underwater explosives, I had a little bit of experience, but those are the most dangerous because they are meant to explode at depth. So you touch one of those barrels, they're that big, it will blow the whole thing up. So we have to be extremely careful not to mess with those uh, barrels down there. And this is a 20 millimeter cannons, as you can see, in perfect conditions. Uh, now, let's see if I can show you. So the main mast is right here. That's the mast. The bell is on the mast in there. And a very tight space. So you're going to have one man at a time. Because we, on us, we have still three tanks. We get rid of two tanks. 
the two shallow one, but you see, look at our three things. So it's tight, tank banging, a lot of noise, and the other guy's ready to go after him. And uh, I got more picture. You can see right here, once again, you start working at the dip, try to cut perfectly made British steel is in perfect condition. Took us five days to cut one inch of steel at that dip. And once again, you can see right here, still working on the mast. You can see here how dark is without the lights. Now here is a close shot. The bell is right here. That's the bell, that's the main mast. The stem is right there. So really not the best place to work. And the other thing we had to deal with was those very sharp metal edge. And we had to put a brace with the lift bag. So once we cut it, it's pretty heavy. If the bell fell into the breeze, we may have never find it anymore. So once again, a lot of stress to be able to retrieve this bell and not lose it. So that's, you can see the bell is right there. And that's me jumping into water. And that's me coming back out of water. And that's the bell. The bell interesting was an incredible finding because we thought it would have the L72 uh, you know, imprinted. But find out after they did the full restoration, he still had HMS Oakley. You know, World War II was a tough time. They had no time to change a bell on a boat. That boat was put in service immediately to do what it's supposed to do. So there was never a change of the, um, of, of the name. That's uh, myself and my friend Sharky. That's a scuba shop in Key Largo. And that's uh, give an idea of the atmosphere before diving. Uh, I'm on the left side right here. That's my friend uh, John C. from the UK. And we have a pre-dive safety check where we got a like a pre-flight check looking at the 2022 bullets point, make sure everything is uh, working properly, is on us, operational. As you can see, there's no talking. This is a very serious, uh, dangerous moment there. And that's the full team. Uh, this is the head of the University of Malta. And uh, this is photographer here, rescue, rescue, rescue. And then other rescue, deep dive one, two, three, four, five, six. That was the team right there. Now, Andrea Doria. Andrea Doria is, uh, yeah. if you guys ever read The Last Dive or uh, uh, Shadow Divers, books very popular in our community. It's a kind of a, an incredible dive, kind of bad situation. We have a, a fantastic cruiser, the Andrea Doria, the pride of Italy, uh, coming in uh, close to New York City, about 110 miles off. New York and 50 miles south on Nantucket in a thick fog. And you had uh, the Stockholm, a smaller boat, but was with a very enforced bow for ice coming from uh, Stockholm, was coming out of the harbor. And being 11 at night, they both had third mate in charge, kids, 23 years old one, 24 years old the other guy. Early on was early time for radar. They both, they were within five miles they were within one mile. They never woke up any senior officer. Next thing, by the time they saw each other, they were in each other. The Andrea Dora got a hit mid, mid boat with the stern, went down in 12 hours. Thankfully only 50 people died considering it was, a, it was about 2,500 people on the wreck. Uh, you guys know the story about many people tried to die, many lose suits. Finally, this was uh, ended at the end in, in the 70s where that wreck is uh, open to people since it's virtually disintegrated. As you can see, there, there's not much of a wreck. If you find an artifact, you can take it. The gentleman approach we all have that either you display and eventually your death, you give to the there's a museum in New Jersey, you, you don't sell it, even though some people are selling it, that's pretty greedy, but we all take stuff that eventually is returned to the museum. And that's a very small boat. That's my kit, my breeder, and my fins right there. And that's my bunker. There's 12 people sleeping in a very small area. I mean, that is a small area for five days. And not much a, a cruise on the entertainment standpoint. Uh, yeah. This is fully loaded, a little bit different than Malta here. It's very dark, very cold. So we have a camera and lights on the helmet. We do not have any hands uh, clogged. And here also we have a, a heated, right here, that's a heated vest because the top on the boat in July is about 100 degrees and the depth is about 40, 39 to 43 degrees. So that's dangerous. If mm -hmm. you, you know, get so heated on the top of the boat, you can pass out. But on the bottom, if you get too cold, you're going to have hypothermia. So that's very tough dive. 
and that's me doing the pre-breather. You can see the this device allowing me to change the temperature of the vest on the dry suit. And that's me jumping. I did those down solo. I couldn't find anybody crazy enough to come with me down there. And uh, this was one of the expeditions. I found some uh, uh, beautiful teacups and saucers or some bottles of, uh, of uh, soda right there. And th that's in my personal collection right here. This is third class towels. Those are the cups, bottles. Interesting enough, the, the third class cups are blue, like those one, blue. Those are maroon and none of us have ever seen the maroon. We've got second class, they're gold, first class, they have a uh, oriental themes, like beautiful themes. So I had no idea. Finally, I was able to have a friend in Italy, General, where they made these cups. Look at it. Those actually are the cups for the uh, officers. So much less number, obviously. Those are the, the uh, captain and his uh, three mates uh, done with those cups, the maroon cups. So that's all part of the deal, getting a nice uh, lobster uh, in 250 feet of water, cold lobster. And this was definitely a nice treat that night right there. And that's the team that they here do with me. Uh, another cool thing was eight, the U869. If you guys have read Shadow Divers, that's the who, who. That's the submarine was found in the 80s and nobody knew what it was. It was a German U boat, was not supposed to be there off of New Jersey in 265 feet of water. It took, it took a few people to die inside of it to be able to find a little butter knife with the name of a sailor, eventually find out the sailor was on the, the U-869. And the story is that when the war ceased, they were underwater, so never got the message, the war is over. They were trying to attack the uh, American destroyers of New Jersey, Block Island, and they were uh, taken down by uh, actually a Coast Guard cutter bombed. This is the blast hole right there, and every so often, the German government won a survey inside. There's still 75 people in there, but it's very dangerous. Those of your boats, if you have a dope one, really small and cables everywhere and, you know, is it, you know, sand. So to get caught in there is very high. So I was, uh, I had the safety diver behind me and I was going in to do the video of all the, uh, pretty much the remains and everything else. Uh, last but not least is a friend of mine in Hawaii, Oha. We find a wreck in 370 feet of water. Uh, we go down there, was not in any charts, was not in any record. And we find a big pile of coal everywhere. And we find this uh, rum jar right there, which is, you know, we look at an iron so nobody can find out. Most likely it was a pirate vessel or something like that. Very cool that this guy is in my personal collection since nobody claim the vessel, so it's in my collection. And Britannic, obviously, that's three people diving kit. That's only three people. Look at how many little breeders are right here and all the safety Bella tanks right there. And that's the team right there. Now, we went in a truck lagoon. I'm sure some of you guys have been there, but we went to look some new deep wreck that they found in excess of 250 feet. And as you can see, the scenario is different. Water is beautifully clear. And obviously, those are incredible wrecks to die. Once again, no bubbles. We don't want to create rust. We don't want to create any deterioration of those magnificent wrecks. And that's a mass gas. Somebody put on the top of a post in the boat, still there waiting for the owner, a light, a bunch of sake. There was an archaeologist on the boat. He was telling us we were shocked how much bottle of sake were in those wrecks. And the story is at the end of the war, when the young men were told pretty much to kamikaze themselves or lose their life for each bomb, for each bullet, they had a bottle of sake loaded on the boats. So those guys will have a little bit of uh, alcohol before they were sent to their you know, um, death. And those are human remains. Uh, those are the lab. 40 millimeter cannons, you can see the, the brass is in perfect condition, the lead is deteriorating. So in conclusion, expedition diving is not well known in the diving community, it's a very small, tiny niche. Technical diving is 0.1 of diving, expedition diving is 0.01 of the technical diving, really small. It, it requires high sets of skills, a team, and a very large financial support, unless you are the owner of Oracle or Microsoft, then you have the mind to do that. We work with government, with the agency, with university and so forth. 
The, the cool thing is as we have technology allow us to dive safely deeper, we'll be able now to dive wrecks deeper because submarine, as you guys know, can go now to any depth, but you, you really cannot go inside the wreck. The feel of being in a submarine versus being in the water and be part of that tragedy is quite a different ordeal. And with this, I thank you and uh, open to any questions you guys may have. Let me see if I can get out of my uh, deal here. Here we are. Mm -hmm. Okay. Dino, that was a very, very interesting and excellent talk. And I'm sure, uh, I, I don't know how many uh, of our members are going to, you know, get into exploration diving. Uh, <laughs> actually, my thought is probably uh, we're closer to being a wreck than an exploration <laughs> diver. Yeah, that's, uh, that was really, uh, you know, my hat's, my hat's off to you. That's, uh, that is absolutely amazing, you know. <laughs> Yes, Dino, I have a question for you, Please. Barry. Um, when you're down that deep, do you feel uh, the nitrogen narcosis and the, the pressure against you? Great question. And the answer is without tramix. At that depth, in, in, so the deeper you go, the less oxygen. So for the 400 plus feet, we have only 8% oxygen. So it's an extremely hypoxic mixture, otherwise you will have seizures. So you don't have any narcosis. We have 8% oxygen, 80% helium, and minimal nitrogen. The problem is when you are shallow, if something goes wrong, shallow, 8%, if the machine don't mix right, one breath, you're out. So on, on the narcosis, we don't because we use a Tramix. Now we're teaching Tramix in 140 feet of water because, I mean, it's just a little money, right? That's all it is. Helium is quite expensive. But why would you have to go where you feel stunned. We, when we train people, we let them do a dive. Typically, those are seasoned divers, 200 feet on air, right? You feel like, I don't drink alcohol, but if somebody took a big sledgehammer, hit you in the head, and then gave you six martini. You don't think straight, even though you're a seasoned diver when you are at 200 feet. So 300 feet would be not a good idea. So non-narcosis on the pressure uh, really, you don't, and once you equalize the first 100 feet, we, can, we make the bottom in about try to six minutes because in technical diving, when you bridge the water, it's considered the dive time. So if, it, if I have a 20 minutes dive, if it takes me 12 minutes to go down, I only have eight minutes a day. So you don't want to waste time and, you know, you go down literally as fast as your ears let you do that. Right, thank you. Sure. So, Dino, I have a question on Please. the Andrea Doria. Um, the, the cups that you brought up, did you get them uh, uh, from the bottom, fanning the sand, or did you go inside the wreck to get those cups? Great question. If you go on YouTube, that two video I put about it. So I got multiple things over the years. Those particular cups were actually underneath the wreck, under the keel. So we had to... We shine a light and there was about a foot, you see those cups. So we really took some sand and got under the wreck to scoop them out. But most of the other things I've gone inside and uh, I got a, there was a beautiful, one of the stupidest thing I've ever done. It was a beautiful brass window, large window from the bridge. And of course I couldn't take it, it's too big. So I, I saw an opening, I said, I can go inside and maybe get some bolt, brass bolt, that big, really beautiful. So we, we teach people, you always have a line, always. Guess what? I'm like 15 feet from the opening. What can go wrong, right? Why waste time? So I go in there and this bolt came loose like it was put in yesterday. Beautiful, no rust, it's brass. Got it out, put, I have a video, that one, put in my pouch. And next thing, for whatever reason, instead of going backwards, I go forward, right? And this wreck gets smaller, smaller, debris everywhere. And I was like, no, this is not it. I'm like 50 feet, supposed to be 15 feet. Something's wrong. This, the, that was definitely the most dangerous time of my life, but I'm lost in a very bad wreck, no line. So you see in the video, I do a 360 helicopter mid, mid water without touching anything at all, because if you silt it out, you're done. And as I 
shine the light in the ceiling. I see a little bit of rust coming when I took the bolt from the ceiling. I was like, I know that's it. So I go there and then I run the line, do what teach people how to do, like you do a circle and find my opening, go out of there. But uh, yeah, we go inside and it's very scary because that wreck is in a horrible condition, horrible. Yeah, that's what I understand. Dino, I, I, I dived the uh, Andrew Dorian in, in 2001. Beautiful, and man. When I, yeah, I hear that it's the hull is collapsing. So the bow is broken now. There's a new crack. The, you know, the bow is a little curved. So there's a crack about 15 feet. And uh, I didn't go to the bow. They, they have a bottle of wine. They're taking, I mean, of course, they're not good to drink. There was a stash of bottle of wine for a third class that they're taking out of it. But uh, I typically go mid-stern looking for the third bell. As you know, two bells were found. The third one has never been found. But uh, right now, if you go on the wreck, you don't know where you are, Jesse. You really have no idea. It's a mess, yeah. complete mess. Very dangerous. Very, very dangerous. Mm. Yeah. Who did you go with in uh, 2001? Which boat? Uh, it was the Seeker. Uh, we left out of Montauk, New York. And Montauk, it, yeah. Where did you leave? Did you leave out of Montauk? The last time was Montauk. The, before it was actually Port Judith in uh, Rhode Island? Rhode Island, yes, sir. Rhode Island. Much, oh, okay. Okay. Much better, much better facility, everything. Yep. Yeah. Now, when I when I dived it, uh, the one of the crew on the boat is a friend of mine, Gary Gentile. Have you, have you, do you know Gary? Oh, I know Gary very well. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I know he's retired now. He's not diving. But uh, he's definitely a, a, a very seasoned diver for sure. Yeah, yeah. He's been a friend of mine since the 1970s. Really good guy. So are you from up there? I'm originally from the Philadelphia area, but I've been okay. in Texas for 40 years. Over so 40 you know years. Bart, do you know by any chance Bart Malone? No, I do not. Okay. Yeah. He, he died on the door. He, he had a beautiful museum. He's the one that's in a museum. Oh. Good, good but there are some Washington, yeah. D.C. divers. And in 1999, we dived... Um, the USS Monitor. Yep. It was a group from uh, the Washington, D.C. area, but I can't give you the names. Of it. <laughs> it was too long ago, but I know uh, I know there's a lot of technical divers in, in your area. Absolutely. Yeah. Go ahead, Max. Do you know? Yes. How old were you when you started getting interested in this kind of diving? You mean the, the regular diving or the crazy diving? No, the crazy diving. <laughs> <laughs> the short That's answer really is I was, old, I was old enough to know better, okay? <laughs> oh, okay. I right like that answer. It's, uh, well, I mean, the way it worked is a friend of mine, I had a picture Sharky, he's a, he's a technical shop in the Florida Keys, uh, called me up, there was this L72, and they needed a deep diver, and there was some medical needs as well. So, you know, better than me. So I go there and cool. I mean, they pay your way. They pay for everything. You, know, you, you get a small per diem, but it's really the adventure. So once you go there, I guess I've never done even a cigarette, but I hear drugs. The first time you do it, you don't stop it. That's my drug right there. <laughs> well, I would say that's a good safe drug, but I don't think so. <laughs> uh, I, I, was, I was reading that um, 16 people have died diving it is that correct uh, on the door i think it's more than that then it's yeah. more good. than that yeah i mean we had three guys in the past one of the crew members still lost at sea we don't know where the but we went to find it never find it so yeah the part of the door diving. is that, i mean somebody's know it it's not that deep but the visibility is awful the currents are brutal because you are on a continental shelf it's cold at the bottom it's hot on the top the, the currents are so strong. We have two drum lines. If you just have one drum line, it will rip you off the boat. So uh, you gotta. The problem is, you go down, it may be perfect, no current, just perfect. On the way up, now you are stuck. You have an hour and a half, two hour deep. It's not long down. Total two and a half. But now you're stuck. You can't get out of the water. Are you fighting? Have you like a, a flag on a pole? Pretty much get beat up. Mm. So what qualifications do you need? You mentioned technical diving, um, also rebreather. I mean, for a young diver who wants to get into exploration, what advice would you give them and what would they need to take? 
right, find well, another hobby. <laughs> right. Typically, I mean, on, on the certification standpoint, you, you the most is 100 meters and it's definitely CCR. So you do your regular recreational diver, then you switch to, we go light tech. So 150 feet with Tramix. There's multiple name, but it's 150 feet with Tramix and very small deco. And then you do the 200 feet with no limit on the deco. And then it used to be, right? You went still from 200 to 330, big jump. Now they've mm -hmm. smartly stopped. You do it 250 and then it's 330 feet. So the big conversation in the world right now is agencies are pushing people to go straight to the breeder, straight. I mean, you want to take down, spend your $15,000, $18,000 a breeder, go for it. And some of us, a lot of us have a lot of problem with that because guess what? If something goes wrong and the breeder is a computer, that's all it is. And computer and water has a lot of issues. Okay, I had one time two breeder failing on the door. Yet. Two brand new fail the same day. Wow. So if computer goes wrong, what do you do? You go back to open circuit bailout. But guess what? If you never really done it, have season experience, the worst time in your life to do something for the first time is when you're drowning. That would be not a good idea. So I don't believe you're going to do the full 100 meters open circuit, but definitely the 200 meters. Have two tanks on you, do at least a number of dives. Are you really familiar with that technique? So if something goes wrong on the breeder, you go right back on it, no issue. So that's now on the exploration side, you know, we have a great place here in uh, AM. They do a uh, uh, they call it exploration dive, but it's not deeper than 80 feet. They have a site all over the European. I mean, the antiquity, there's nothing antique in the US, of course. They go in, in Greece and Italy and so forth. But I know the director there, good way to start. For the deep, deep stuff is a word of mouth. We, we, the bottom line is we don't want anybody to die because if somebody dies, the, the whole program is shut down. The university, you understand, lose, lose the license. So we, we can't have, I to say, we can't have a dead person. So we pick up the crown or the crop or the crown, the best one. <coughs> the computer, the, oh, sorry. <laughs> the computer that uh, you're using has to be very complex because it's figuring in uh, composition, depth, time. Um, is that part of, that's part of the, part of what you go down with, I'm sure. Right. I mean, believe me or not, everybody now in the technical world uses shear water. That's pretty much, you know, that's it. And mm -hmm. the beauty is like some of the new debris, the best debris, have the same computer. Now, he has a cable goes to your debris. So everything is talking to each other. We have the nerd on the eye. Everything talks the same language. And I'm sure some of you guys have shear water. That is the most intuitive, basic computer. You sell it. You tell the people, don't worry about the instruction. Just... It speaks for itself. Now, obviously, when you go deep, there are so many things that you gotta look at. What kind of risk factor you want to take? It's called gradient factors that you know determine how much you know. The safer you are, the longer you stay. And 400 plus feet, if you go conservative, my God, you'll be eight hours, nine hours for a dive. I mean, then your body gets in uh, serious trouble anyway. <laughs> You mentioned the time, how much time that you had to spend and deco. How much was that? I forget. Typically about eight or a six hour down, five hours and 40, five hours and 40 minutes. Yeah, 20 minutes at the bottom and five plus hours of hanging on a, on a actually it gets better. Hanging on a line is not an issue because we are the Superman, right? The first time I went, um, they, they have trapezoids, so they have beautiful two lines with the metal poles. What do you do? I mean, that's a long way, right? You hold on the, on the bar. So we got in the boat, and my there's two major agency there, TDI and IND, I mean, and Ray. And on the boat, there's the, the best dog of both company. And they, you know, that's a big macho. So they say, you are not going to hold on the bar. You cannot let us down. So we don't do that. We got to suspend ourselves mid-water, looking at the bar, for five hours, 90 minutes at 20 feet, an hour and a half at 20 feet, just looking each other in the face, like dogs ready to cut each other's throat pretty much. Wow. So no no video games or anything like that? <laughs> no, no, there was, a, there was a comedy made in the past, like a music look, looking thing for Shallow. And the, the, the problem is, you know, 
you you have a computer look at your oxygen in the blood. If you miss that couple of minutes, uh, you can no, there's no distraction. You that computer pretty much you look the, the going down minute by minute. <laughs> Oh, you are very dedicated. <laughs> wow. Sounds like a lot of excitement and then a lot of boredom. <laughs> uh -huh. That's uh, nobody likes that. Well, I got a, a, hopefully a good news. So you guys know Richie Kohler, Richie, a friend of mine. And when he does Britannic, he dives a half month. So I was like, what in the hell do you do, man? So when we dive, like I said, we have about 80% healing. So what do you do? You put your computer 80% healing and the computer calculate and tell you five hours. Richie dived 80%, but he puts in his uh, computer, he's diving 50% healing. And the computer gives two hours, three hours less. So that's called the healing penalty. I know for a fact that every major academic center that do diving medicine uh, and we're looking at that and they are hopefully coming soon with a kind of agreement that we are killing ourselves on the helium just because people don't know right Physio physiology is not known maybe in the next couple of years if that comes out there's no actually we're doing too much deco all the company will change the algorithm share water and then whatever so that we actually can cut down two three hours that we're just sitting there looking at the blue, but yeah, people are rich and cool, you know, he, he doesn't care. He just I, cheap on the computer. So I would think that he, I would think that helium uh, migrates very rapidly in tissues. And that, well, that's the whole concept. They had to create an algorithm based on uh, experimental data. There's really nothing in humans. Nobody wants to get bent at that depth you die. So now they're looking at other models and some people like Richie have done this for a while and try to really say if it's not dangerous why would we you know take so much time but I think it'll be a couple of years every time at dive tech in Florida we talk about it and I think in a couple of years I hope something comes out of it that they can change the algorithm in the computers. A number of years ago we, we saw the um we went to a lecture by the author of Shadow Divers, and he mentioned that they were making a movie out of the book, but we never, I never saw anything about the movie. Do you know what happened? No, that? I don't. As you guys know, the, the two, you know, people that were mainly involved, Richie Kohler and um, uh, John Charlton, they were buddy for a long time. They hate each other. They, I don't both, they're both my friends, but you dare mentioning one to the other, you know, you got a punch fight. Those guys, you know, Great divers, obviously, but they just have a lot of a personal issue. And they, when that went bad, everything else, the show and TV went bad, and all the, you know, stream down, downstream went bad. I don't think there'll be anything coming out of it. Too bad. Well, thank you so much, Dino. That was fantastic. That was fantastic. Uh, yeah. Good yeah. find, Dave. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I encourage, uh, encourage all of you if you're out, if you're out, out and about uh, Dino's divings over in Arlington. It's a very, very well organized uh, store, and you'll meet a very interesting character named Greg Johnson when you go in there, who's who has uh, been a Patty Course director for for a long time, but. Uh, it's a it's a neat resource. It's sort of a, a hidden secret, I call it. So, yeah. if you're yep. looking for something, it's a, a good a good place to go. Where in Arlington are you located, Dino? Uh, you know, park like three o three. Yes, Pioneer Parkway, and yeah. almost at the corner with the Bowen at three o three, right there. Oh, okay. All right, that'd be interesting. I'd love to be able to do some of that, but I think. Uh, Time is not on my side. <laughs> and, your wife you know, and my wife and me, there's, I just got it. <laughs> you know, you know, for example, for you, you guys like photography, obviously. Oh, yeah. One of the things that is beautiful to do is the deck of the, or, uh, the Oriskan, you know, the USS Carrier is 150 feet. You know, not everything is 400, 500. That's extreme. We're talking about extreme, right? Right. But the Oriskan is right here in Pensacola. It's a beautiful wreck. And Everybody stops at 120, 130, which pretty much everybody goes. Below is the best part. I mean, I've gone to the props and everything, but the, the flat deck is only 150 feet. 
Now that's reachable by all of these. It's different stories. A single deco tank, open circuit is maybe, you know, hour, an hour, 10 minutes dive total. So this is a different world compared, but it's doable. And then 180, they have the hangers. Talk about spectacular. They have a full blown aircraft hangers with the, the, there's like an escalator, the first escalator ever built on a, on a boat, 160 feet. So great things to do with some grip footage if you guys like it. All right. Hey, Dino, I had one question. On the, uh, on the bar for your deco, do they have a porta potty there too? <laughs> <laughs> well, Dave, that's the dirty side of taking a deep taking of that. You have two options. You can put a, the pant and look like really at a, ahead of your age, <laughs> or you put one of those hospital condom cap, which is nasty, and you pee out of your leg. It, the, that portion of it is just nasty. No, <laughs> no, there's no part of body. <laughs> well, again, Dino, we want to really, really thank you for this. It was, it was extremely right. enjoyable, and you know, it, it's, it's hard not meeting as a group, and we certainly do invite you. Uh, when we're all back together to come uh, one Sunday and be my guest and uh, come and meet everybody, you know, face to face. I think uh, it's a, a pretty neat group of people. I will be honored, Dave, if you do that. I'll, as long as I'm not working or doing something, I would love to come. Meet you guys. I would love to have you. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. 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 I'd love and to see your you. personal collection. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> no. one, I'll show only one piece because the big collection is a different style. So one piece, you lose your mind. Okay. Oh gosh! <laughs> well, and Polly's, Barry, thanks, thanks yes. for in, uh, inviting the the Hops people. Oh, always, thanks, you guys. Are, yes, thank yeah, you. Always invited. And thank you for attending. And yeah, and yay, Jesse, Jesse and and tell Hi, Mike Jesse. also thanks for coming. Je Jesse, uh, where are you located right now? Uh, right now I'm in Alabama. I'm up, uh, halfway to North Carolina. Oh, good. All right. Oh. Yeah, I'm in it. Yeah, I'm in it. Yeah. Oh, no, right <laughs> this Andrea do your first class flower pot. First wow. class. Wow. 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 Oh, it's in perfect condition. It's oh, it's in beautiful. perfect condition. You know, that's, that's beautiful. A, that's, that's gorgeous. Uh, so that's, that's one of the many things. That, this is a beautiful piece. We, like I said, if you got some point, I would love to show it to you. We take them because they're going to be lost eventually. Will be given to this museum in New Jersey that Bart Malone used to run. But uh, yeah, very nice. Oh, no wow. kidding. Oh, Thank congratulations on that. Great. Yeah. Well, okay, everyone, we will uh, finish the meeting here. But before we do, hopefully, keep your fingers crossed, mm -hmm. we'll be able to go back to the uh, Outback for April. And Yay. again, we'll, we'll stay yeah. separated as much as we can. And it'll be a real informal meeting so we don't have to. Uh, stay and and be close to each other and and uh you know be closer than what we have to and we'll actually be able to enjoy each other again yeah, they've been great there at outback i talked to her she's reserved the meeting date every month since since january and she was agreeable to letting us come back when we felt like we were ready yeah that's good so they've been great yeah so everyone take care be safe and look, be sure and wow. vote. Your uh, vote sh will be next Sunday at noon. And also uh, we're waiting for Rich to get back from his trip. And he said he would have everything out hopefully Tuesday or Wednesday. So everyone take care, enjoy it. And thank you again, Dino. Really enjoyed yeah, that. Bye-bye. Really thank you. Very good. Bye-bye, okay. everyone. Bye. 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 Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye, everyone.